Father, we thank you, God, for, for this day that has been appointed for us to come into your house. Lord, this morning we come into your house expecting nothing but the miraculous that you alone can do. God, we have seen through your word, through how through the ages that you have ripped down walls, how you have torn apart things, God, that needed to be torn apart so that you can build everything that we need into our lives. And Lord, this morning as we gather here in your house, Father, we just bless your name. We invite you in. We pray for your presence. And we ask you to guide us in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but that was a pretty fantastic baptism. I, I can't get over what I saw and how I felt. And Oh, hello. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it is Valentine's week, you know, y'all. And so here we go. We're you know, I kind of, I kind of like your hair up like that. Well, you know, you don't, you don't always do that. What's up with that? I mean, thank you. It I was really, raining, and I just wanted to. But put I think, it. I think it's cute how it, how it makes your, your ears stick out a little bit like that. It's really, really cute. I like that. Why would you say that? Well, the you know, one thing kinda... that you, the one thing that you know, is gonna really tick me off, and in front of everybody, you're gonna say that. Why would you say that? This is why I don't wear my hair up. And this is what we're going to do in front of everybody. Baby, I was just kidding. I mean, You're not just kidding. You do it all the time. You think it's funny, and I've told you time and time again it's not. Why do you always do this? Because you're just like your dad. You're always doing it just oh, like your dad. You're just like Here your dad. we go again. Well, it's the way it is. And I've told you I don't like it. Where, where are you going? Oh, I'm coming over here because over there you're a jerk. So if I'm over here. So you tell me that I never initiate things, and I do, and this is what I get. I'm because trying to, I'm in like, the middle of all of it, this initiate. is what happens. You initiate it, and then look what you do. Listen, I didn't make your ears. God did. Oh, well, let me tell you something about my ears. You won't have to worry about my ears if I'm over here, hey, where, see. Where if going? I'm over here, you won't have to worry about see, them at all. See, this is what you do. You think, I'm trying to make things better between us, and you're taking off and running. Where, where are you going? I'm over here, because Hold if y'all don't over there, you don't have to talk about my ears at all. Because the one thing, Jeff, the one thing. God, here we go here again. Here we go again. That's where we always end up. Here we go again. Man, I don't even know what to say to you. I'm trying to make things better, and here you are running. Well, I'll talk to you later. Where are you going? I'm going over here. I'll see you later. Time out, church. Time out. Do you see what just happened right there? It was wonderful and great and good right there. And in just a moment, did you see those walls go up? Did you see those walls go up? Can we come back to here? Will you be nice? I'm sorry about your ears. It's okay. <laughs> Y'all welcome my beautiful bride, Jackie Lynch, to the stage again this morning. We ain't going to need those. It ain't that kind of a deal. Let me get situated here. Well, we, we want to talk to you this morning in the second part of a, a series of messages called Before and After. And in this second part, we're going to be talking about, about walls. Anybody ever experience any walls going up in your relationship? Go on, go on, go on stick it up high and proud. Uh, some of y'all looking around like, well, what, you better not stick your hand up right they now. They say, look straight ahead. Look straight, look straight ahead. <laughs> um, well, so, so the title of this little message today, and again, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you last week. It is impossible for us to script this thing out, so, so what we do is just kind of come up with an outline. It's the same outline you have in front of you, and we just kind of uh, uh, go in with it where it goes as we go along. So hang in there with us. So the title of this message, the second part in the series today, is called Take Down These Walls. Take Down These Walls. And so, so people of a certain age, if you, were, if you were alive and well in the late 80s, early 90s, you'll, you'll know where that phrase came from, right? Uh, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. That's right. That's right. Ronald Reagan's uh, famous speech at the Berlin Wall. And without going through all the history of that, what was he saying? He was saying that it's time where this Berlin Wall has been separating people. People on this side are struggling, struggling, struggling. They can't get to a better life because of this wall. But if this wall comes down, life is good over here. In too many marriages, in too many relationships today, we're never taught to identify what the walls are that go up in our relationship. And if we don't know what the walls are, how do we avoid the walls? And even more important, how do we take those walls down? 
And so, first thing I want you guys to hear today is that you are a child of God. God loves you. God loves you. God loves your spouse. And if you stood before God and took those vows and made a covenant, and that's a special word, man. A covenant means we're going into this thing with no back door. If you took those vows and made a covenant before God, it's not just you and God in this thing. It's not just you and your spouse. It's you and your spouse and God in this marriage. And he loves both of you. And he wants to work in that marriage to make it beautiful and wonderful. Sometimes, how many of y'all know we are working against God in our own marriages? We're working against him. And so this morning, we're going to talk about what it takes to take down the walls. Two main sessions in our, or sections in our, our, our message today. One is what makes the walls, and then two is how can I tear down the walls. So let's start at the beginning. What, what makes the walls? Jackie, I'm going to ask you to help me with this a little bit this morning. Um, as I was praying about where do we go with this this morning, God brought me back to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And if you've been to a wedding any time recently, you've probably heard a portion of 1 Corinthians 13 preached. Maybe you had these words preached at your own wedding. And so it's amazing how in 1 Corinthians 13, God shows us what love really is. And without going on a real tangent on this thing, you know, you realize that the Bible that we have today is, is, is translated from the original language into our language. And so in the original Greek language that these words were translated in, we have one word for love, but they would have had multiple words. So, so the word that we're translating as love here is not like, hey, I love you, brother. We're good friends. We're whatever. Uh, it's the word um, agape love, which means there is no bottom to the love. There's no end to what I would do for you. And that's what love is. And so um, what makes walls? Here goes the first thing. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Jackie, as I read that, um, that tells us what love is. If we invert that thing, we see the opposite of that. And I think what we see in finding maybe the opposite of those things, it says love is patient, kind, does not envy, is not boast, is not proud. If you're taking notes, you're going to have to go quickly with me because I'm not going to hang out on all of these. But I see four, at least four things here. Um, what makes walls? Well, based on, on verse 4, what makes walls is when someone's impatient, when someone is mean. If you're taking notes, you can fill these lines in. Impatient and mean and jealous and when the pride monster comes into the relationship. So hearing that impatient, mean, jealous, the pride monster, um, I'm going out on a limb here in front of all of our good friends here. If you see something in me, or if you see something in it, as you deal with lots of other people, based on these four, impatient, mean, jealous, the pride monster, what, where, where do you um, initially go to with that to say that's something that I know causes walls to go up? The mean and the jealous. Talk to me about that. Couples, it irritates me so, so much to hear couples who are mean to each other, put each other down, nothing nice to say about each other, but let somebody else pay attention to your wife or your spouse, and then you want to go after them. And I'm thinking, you don't even like them. Like, you, you have nothing good to say about them, but let somebody else look at them, and now you want to go after them. I don't understand that at all. If you really love someone, you're going to build them up. You are going to water the grass that's in your own backyard. Then you won't get upset when somebody wants to come mow your own grass. You know what I mean? So I don't understand why. Well, when you talk about mowing the grass, what? Well, yeah, never mind. That's, that's week four. That's week four. Never yeah, mind. I got you. You understand what I mean. I understand what you mean. Yeah. So, so, Jeff, I can tell you right now which one you're going to go to. You want <laughs> so impatient, mean, jealous, and the pride monster. Now realize we're talking about what causes walls to go up. This has two sides to this wall. And so the one that jumps out to me is impatient. Impatient. So, so I don't know how many guys, let's talk just a minute. I saw somebody, I'm not going to mention who it was, just got punched in the ribs right there. Um, <laughs> I was raised in a world where if you're supposed to be somewhere at 2 o'clock, if you're five minutes early, you're 15 minutes late. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you, you get there early. Get there early. Don't keep people waiting on you. It's rude to make people wait, etc. God has a sense of humor, y'all. Come on, somebody. God will put you with somebody who, who decides it's time to get ready, and it's going to take 45 minutes to get ready, but we're going to get started getting ready at 10 till, and we should have done been there. Now, 
let me, let me tell on myself here. I'm not, I told Jackie coming into this, I don't want to come in in front of all of y'all and say things to tear her down and, 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 and hurt her. I don't want to do that. What I'm saying with this impatient thing, what can cause the walls to go up is when I get impatient with her and I'm thinking, come on, let's go. Let's get out the door. Let's get out the door. And she's trying to get ready, but I can turn impatient into mean and rude and all of these other things. So men, what do we do with that? Well, you got to know your wife. You got to know your wife. We'll talk about how to tear that down later on. We got to have some conversation. So that's the first one. Um, am, I, am I heading in the right direction? With that? <laughs> You're good. Anything you want to say to that? No, keep going. <laughs> okay. Second one. So that, that kind of hits four. We won't go through all of those. But uh, the next verse in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, says, talking about love, it says it's not rude, it's not self seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. So, so that's what love is. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record wrong. What's the inverse of that? Well, what's going to cause walls to go up is if I'm rude, if I'm selfish, if I'm a hothead, or if I am the recorder. Where do you go with all of that? Well, I mean, I could hit on all four of those, but, but I was raised, when you talk to somebody, you talk like... I, my dad said, you think I hear with my eyes. I do. I th- when, you're, when I'm talking to someone, I, I want to look them in the eyes. Most of the time, couples see the top of their other spouse's head because they're on the phone. It drives me insane. Um, I, I just think it's rude. Um, we see couples all the time. We talked about that last week. Uh, why in the world would you want to go out and spend money to see somebody's the top of their head? I don't know. Sitting across the table from them uh, to see the top of their head. So... In that vein, if I am trying to talk to you and you are doing other things, then I might get a little hot-headed and throw a fit and do a dance and hold my breath. And then, yeah, then, then the party really starts. So. so that's what the wall looks like. And so when I'm rude to you, it makes your wall start to go up. You know, you bring up a really good point. I don't, I don't want to just fly through that. I've said this in, in lots of marriage ceremonies that I do. When, when I do a, uh, a wedding for someone, I get kind of past all the vows and kind of do a little personal thing with folks. And, and, and I may have married some of y'all and said this to you. But, but one of the things I try to say to folks is kind of giving some, some tips about being married well. And, and one of those things is, is to listen to your spouse. And I mean really listen. Like, like, and I'll say it like this. Listen with both ears open. Listen to what they have to say, don't listen trying to form a response, right? So, so when I'm actively listening, then you know, and so you've, you've taught me this. When we first got together, you know, um, I, can, I can be typing on my iPad and listening to you, or I can be watching the game and listening to you, but when I do that, that says to you, you don't care. You're not paying attention. In my mind, I'm like, I hear every word you said. But what I have to realize is that when I'm not looking in your eyes and listening that way, it doesn't matter how I process it. What matters is what it does to you. Right. So that's good. You bring up a really good one there. Um, man, I hate it when you call me out like that in front of everybody. But it's right. It's absolutely right. And, and so we'll see when we get to the end of this why it's important to do that calling out thing. The one that jumps out off the page to me there is what causes the wall to go up is the recorder. The recorder. What do I mean by the recorder? Well, man, how many of y'all have been married more than five years? Raise your hand. More than 10 years. More than 15 years. More than 20 years. More than 25 years. Okay, you can put your hands down. Don't raise your hand on this one. For your own health and marriage, don't raise your hand on this one. Um, anybody know anybody whose spouse remembers everything they did to hold doggone 25 years, Right? Every wrong thing you've ever done, every mistake you made, every argument that you've ever gotten into, right? What does the recorder do? It says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, y'all, I could make a lot of funny jokes about that, about how, how nitpicking and nag. I, I could say a lot of things about that. But listen to what God's saying. Love is saying, God is saying that love keeps no record of wrongs. How do you get there? Some, some, of, some of us in this room, if we, if we were sitting across the table eating a bucket of chips, I'm talking about a bucket, right? A whole bunch of them. If we're eating chips, we might have a conversation and you might say, well, Jeff, you don't know what she did. You don't know what he did. Well, let me ask you a question. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to live in that mess for another year, five years, 10 years? 
Or are you going to choose to clean it up, to forgive each other, and find your way back to here? Do you want to live uh, separated, or do you want to live together? Love is, is caring more about the other person than I care about myself. And, and love is caring about keeping things together. What are you saying, Jeff? I'm saying to some of you today that God knows what has been done to you. You know what's been done. And, and it, it, let's just say it this way. Okay, it wasn't right. Maybe your spouse has done something terrible. Maybe you've done something sp- terrible to your spouse. You need to forgive yourself. You need to let God forgive them. And then it's time to move on. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Does that make sense? She said, yes, it does. We keep moving from there. All right. Um, <laughs> the, next, the next verse, verse 6, it really doesn't give us a list in this one. Interesting verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. What do you hear there? So we talked about that last night, and the girls will know what I'm talking about. It does not make me happy when I'm right. However, well, it does make you happy when however, you're right. When I try to tell you something and you don't understand what I'm saying, like I do sock puppets, maybe charades, and you don't get it. And then when, Listen, I'm a man. I'm simple, okay? And then when somebody says the same thing that I say and it's right, and I think to myself, yes. You hush over there. You egging her on. I hear you. Right I'm now. just saying. I'm just saying that I don't want I, – I, I just it's, – it's nice when, when, when it – there's confirmation. I don't want anything to happen to you. I don't want to rub it in your face. I'm just saying. The women are always right. <laughs> Is that what he said? He said, you're yes, always I right. I paid him $2. We've been married eight years and I haven't figured out that you're always right. Okay, I got it, got it, got it. It says, love does not delight in evil. And I, I read that over and over and over this morning. I'm like, what is this verse trying to say? Love does not delight in evil. Well, of course. I mean, nobody wants to see somebody do something terrible to a little kid or a puppy or a kitty cat, right? Love does not delight in evil, but it always rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. If, if, if those are opposites. And I, so what it's saying is I, no matter what's happened between us, like we, we would love to always be right here and life to be great and wonderful, but we all know, man, that life gets hard, right? Marriage is hard. Anybody want to say amen to that? Marriage is hard. It is. Um, but, but just because marriage is hard and because you got your feelings hurt or your wife's fussing at you or your, your husband's acting like a jerk doesn't mean that we stay in that place um, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And the truth is that God has created us to be knit together, to be one. And the truth is that we have to do the hard work to work through that and to tear down the walls and to keep coming back to square one because walls drive us apart from each other. I've said this lots of times before in a different context, but you know, God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And I heard that for years and I thought, well, isn't that being redundant? Is God saying, I won't ever leave you? What's the difference in leaving you and forsaking you? And I think that applies to marriage as well because, because uh, you could say, I'll never leave you. But you may have to go to work and go in one direction. I have to go in another direction. We, we leave physically. But when we say that I'll never forsake you, when you forsake someone, you withdraw your emotions from them. When you forsake someone, it's like, man, I've had all I can take. That's the end of the line. I'm cutting them off, and we may, we may have to live under the same roof, but I ain't going to like it. We might share a spatula. We might watch the same TV, and we may raise these kids, but I don't like you, and I don't want to be here. Too many people live that way. And God is saying, God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What's God saying to us? He's saying, no matter what you do as God, I will always forgive you if you're willing to come back to me. There's no, there's no distance you can go that's too far. But we as humans are not God. And how do, we, how do we operate in that? How do we operate in this place of I'll never forsake you? Y'all ever heard the saying, it takes two to tango? Both of us have to be working at this thing. Um, love... Uh, rejoices with the truth. And the truth is that God wants us to figure out how to work it out. Now, let me say this. It's not always possible to work it out. It is not always possible to work it out. There are, there are occasions, and that's another sermon for another day, but the Bible does give reasons and, and seasons for when the best thing that can happen is for two people to part their ways. But we don't go there until we've done everything we can to try to make it work. But it's also important on the front end, marriage is not something to just jump into. 
had I known then what I know now, uh, there wouldn't have been multiple times of me getting it wrong. Uh, there would have been one time that I, if someone had told me this before, uh, if someone had slowed me down, if someone had said, this is a covenant, not a contract, mm. uh, there would have been time for me and other people to think about it before. I just want to get out of my mama's house. I just, th we've been dating so long. This is just the next step. Um, this, j you know, it's not just another decision. It's a life co you know, covenant. So I think society has watered down marriage to it's just something that you do until you just don't want to do it anymore. And then you get out of it until you want to do it again. The church has a major responsibility to say that what you just said. I want to honor you for being transparent right there. You're just saying, hey, here's who I am. I'm Jackie and this is my life. And, and you're saying to this congregation, I love you guys enough to share my life with me. It hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows, but let me tell you what I've learned. I appreciate that. Listen, I was talking to a precious couple in the lobby right before service, and I said not one time before any of those marriages did I ask God, was this the right thing to do? Not one time. I asked my girlfriends. I asked you know, my friend, your friends will tell you anything you want to hear. You do know that. And I asked my mom, my mom loved him. I'm, I was thankful that she loved him. I wanted her approval, right? So I thought if she liked him, then I must like him too. So I did that. My mom picked out my dress. She picked out my china. She picked out the bridesmaids dresses. She picked out the food. She picked out everything. And I thought if I did this, then she'll love me. It was hell. And so the couple and I said, I said, how, where would you be if you were still married to the first person that you were married to? And both of them said, oh, my goodness. And I said, when you and I got together, my pastor said to you, Jeff, which one do you want her to still be married to? Right. And we went through the whole scenario, and you said none of them, none of them. I think we have a large responsibility, and I'm so glad that small groups are starting up so that we have time in those small groups to say, and I, I'm glad that we are, we are having these discussions because older people in our church need to mentor middle-aged people, and middle-aged people need to mentor our youth, and youth need to mentor. We need to have the trickle-down now to say to, these, to everybody, you have to slow down. You have to find out who you are. You have to find out who God is has made you to be, and then you find out who your life My partner God. is. You're, you're speaking right there, man. And I look around this room, and I see some of our teenagers and, and young people and folks who, who maybe are looking to, to, to be married soon or one day to be married. Church, don't let TikTok tell you how to get married. Don't let Instagram tell you how to be married and how to do relationships. Don't, don't let anything other than God's Word tell you how to be married. Don't, don't, don't take advice from people who, who are not living out godliness in their lives. And you listen to what she's telling you. Young ladies, if you're looking to be married soon or one day, hear what she's telling you. Hear what she's telling you. You, you, you trust God with your future. You trust God, not some man. And God will send you the right man if you'll trust Him. Don't, don't, don't go busting down doors that God's not, not, not opening for you. Yeah. Young men, say the same thing to you. Don't, ju just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Right. God will bring you the right spouse if you will trust him. Right. So I really thought they'd say amen. And, and it really, I, I thought we might take the God. roof off with that, but it didn't really happen for us that time. Maybe next time it will. But God is good. God is good, isn't he? All the time. <laughs> so, so one more in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Man, this is powerful. It says in verse 7, it says, Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You know what the, 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 the opposite of, of a love that always protects? It's a love that makes someone be vulnerable, exposed. Um, the opposite of love always trusts is, is there's always doubt in the relationship, distrust. Um, uh, the opposite of love always hopes hoping for the other person. Well, the opposite of that is, is self-focused. The wall goes up when I'm so focused on me and I never think about you. And, and the opposite of love always perseveres, sticks with it, hangs in there, works through the hard times. It's the rabbit. It's the rabbit that always runs. Things get hot and boom, the rabbit is off and gone. What, is there one of those that stands out and speaks to you that puts up walls? <laughs> I am never going to check your phone. If I have to check your phone, see ya. 
If I have to wonder where you are, if I have to check behind you, if I have to have your location, if I have to do all that, no thank you. I, I have too much going on. I've got kids and grandkids and a life, and it's just not even worth it. I'm Bro, not I can't mama, keep one woman happy, much less two or three And I'm not going to raise you, and yeah, I, I, I have no uh, desire to do that at all. But you said to me one time, I stopped at a gas station somewhere, went in to Knowing me, probably getting a Reese cup and a Diet Mountain Dew, wouldn't you think that probably what it was? We probably stopped on the side of the road. Had you probably to... didn't bring me back nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, True anyway. story. We were in the laundromat. You knew I was going to tell the story. Stepped into this one. Yeah. So something happened to our washing machine. Just so happened we were going to do this um, message this week. And he said, I need to step over here to the convenience market and get another thing of quarters. And I said, great. He came back with one Mountain Dew. It, it, it was for you, baby. I just no, it checked, wasn't. I just checked it to make sure it was cold. I don't even drink Mountain Dew. So I stood there for a minute, and I thought about all of this stuff, and I thought, I'm going to do it. Is, where's my Mountain Dew? And he said, I was just getting quarters, Jackie. I just, I just grabbed a drink. I said, for yourself. You just grabbed a drink for yourself. And he said, do you want some? And I said, no, I do not. I thought we would share. No. We're on a budget. <laughs> Shoot, I was getting ready to brag all over myself there. And got, <laughs> I was going to brag about how I left my phone in the truck, and you could look at it and see anything you wanted to because you know the password to it and anything you want. If, if you see anything, I, I was... I want the drink. <laughs> Note taken. All right. I know, right? Vulnerable, doubting, self-focused, the rabbit. We won't go into all of those. But, but you, you need to talk about the rabbit. Well, okay, it is a wall that goes up because um, all I can speak to is my side of it, but, but the way that I was raised, you know, we've talked about marriage being a covenant, not a contract. A contract, two people go into business and you sign a contract. The lawyers work this thing up so that the contract details out if this business fails, how do we get out of it? A contract's telling you how to get out of something. Well, we don't go into marriage as a contract. We go into it as a covenant because there is no back door. There, we go into marriage as a covenant saying, we're going here till somebody's at the undertaker's place. Come on, somebody. And so, so when, 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 when I talk about the rabbit, what y'all just saw happen right there, hey, <laughs> that's happened too many times. That, that, I mean, that was not a fabrication. That happens at our house. And, and, and those, those, <laughs> those, those things happen. And so, so if she decides, well, I'm leaving. Now, she ain't ever made it any farther than Ricky's Market, which I can throw a football to. She don't go far, but, but she's making her point that she can leave. And I'm like, where are you going? Stay here and let's fuss and fight and argue and, and let's work this thing out. But, but so, so for me, as long as I know you're coming back and we're going to work it out, I don't have to get on Zillow and find me a new apartment and all of that. I quit doing that when you would say, all right, listen, if you're going to run, just tell me where you're going so I could go. I want to be wherever you are. So you just tell me where you're going and then I'll just meet you there. And I was like, well, what fun is that? That's good. That's right, doggone it. Quit running, you little rabbit. All right, let's change gears a minute. We've talked about what some of the walls are. How do we tear down the walls? Man. That's that. Now we're getting ready to get into the work. It's, it's one thing to identify these things, but how do we tear them down? So you're going to have to help me with this. I'll kick it off, and you jump in and help me as we go. So I'm going to give you four, th four ways that you can tear down the walls, or at least get started with it. And can, let, let me see your eyeballs just a minute. Before we start into this, I want you to just go with me, like, like right now, just inside your mind, your spirit, your heart, your soul, whatever. If this is a struggle... And if you feel like in your relationship that there are walls, and maybe you don't know how to tear them down, maybe you've known that this is something that you've needed to do for a long time, but you have no idea how to do it, just right now where you're sitting, just inside your mind, you don't have to let the other one know, just ask God to help you right now. God, show me. Here's the first thing, four things about how we tear down the walls. Number one, humble myself. Humble myself. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others, in this case your spouse, better than yourselves. Y'all, this one, if I can just be honest with y'all, this one sucks. 
This one sucks because we get in an argument and the thing goes up, 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 up. It escalates, escalates, escalates. And, and I'll be mad for a while, but I'm wired in a way where I ain't going to stay mad too long. And at some point, I've got to come back and say, all right, let's figure out how to fix this. But you know what that requires? For either one of us, and you, you're good at this too. You, you, are, you are not stubborn. You don't dig your heels in. But what this requires is for me to say, okay, what do I own in this? What's my part of this? What, and sometimes, sometimes I can get so angry at her because of how bullheaded and stubborn and whatever that she may be being in the moment. But I have to get past that and say, all right, let me, let me try to see this from her viewpoint. What, what am I not saying that she wants to hear? What am I doing that's, that's making her feel this way? What do I own in this? Once I figure that out, then it's a matter of being willing to come back and say, babe, I know that I have ticked you off. I know you're angry with me. I don't want us to be here. And if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm judging this right, I think where you are is this. And I'm sorry. I did this. Guys, I don't always do that perfectly. It might take me a little while to get there. But I have to humble myself to be able to come back and say, because I, you know, I, heard, I got a buddy of mine that said, you ever been out on a country road and a tractor pulls out in front of you and it's going 15 miles an hour and you can flash your lights and you can blow your horn, you can't get around it. There is nothing you can do to make that tractor in front of you pull off the side of the road. You can try. And, and we can't fix anybody else, but I can deal with my own stuff. Anything you're hearing in that? So when I was in school, I got off the school bus one day, and I walked in, and my mama loved Dr. Phil. And my mom said, I got a word for you. And I said, what is it? And she said, every situation needs a hero. And I said, that's a good, good. word. That's, that's good. a good word. And that has stuck with me. And so when you and I get in the spin cycle, you know what I'm talking about, guys, the spin cycle where nobody can get out of it, and you're just going round and round and round and round and round, and, and both people think that they're right, Somebody has to stop it. Like, so, the situation needs a hero. Well, why not you? Right. And so every time I've done that with you, you have thanked me for that. And it's, it always comes back, and you, you honor me, and you thank me, and you say, God, Jack, I didn't know how to get us out of that, but you stepped up to the plate, and you said what you said, and, and I just really thank you for that because I, I just I didn't know how to get us out of that. Man, that makes me feel 10 feet tall. And, and I'm willing to do it again because you say, hey, man, thank you for doing that. Um, so every situation needs a hero. Why, why not you? You know, you I teach. like it when you be the hero. Well, sometimes thing. you need to be the hero. You know what else I like? To make up leaven when it's all over. Anyway, come on. So, oh, my Lord. Every situation needs a hero. We're not supposed to talk about that, are we? That's week four. All right. Next one. Forgive my spouse. Forgive my sp <laughs> forgive my spouse. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. He who covers over a matter promotes love. Um, anybody here have a well at your house? You're on well water? Anybody have a well? You ever, you ever had to cap off of that well and look down in the thing? Well, thank God that there is a cap on that well because if that, if that big that big hole were just out in the middle of your yard and you've got grandkids or kids that's playing around in the yard and there were no cap on it, what would those kids do? Well, that deep, 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 deep well, those kids could run and not see it and run right into the well and fall into it. But when you cap that thing over, now you have the goodness of the well, but you don't have the danger that goes with it being open. He says, he who covers over an offense promotes love. So many times in our relationships, we have these open, deep, pit hole, potholes, wells even that are so deep and we don't cover them over. We don't fix them and they're, they're, they're wide open in our relationships. So what happens? We, we keep running into them and dropping down to the hole. And, and it's like we never learn. It takes so much work to climb out of that hole and we get out of the hole, but we don't cover over the offense. We don't fix the thing. We don't stop doing the thing and we keep going back and falling in the hole. He says, he, he who covers over an offense promotes love. But, he, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Well, we're not close friends. We're husband and wife. And if we keep repeating the thing, we're going to keep ending up in the same place. So we have to fix things. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's not just about me and you either. It's about our kids. It's about the, our friends. It's about our church. It's about the people we do life with. I was, you know, sitting here yesterday talking to a beautiful girl that goes to our church, and she was like, you know, my parents fought all the time. We begged God for our parents to get divorced. It would have been much better if our parents had gotten divorced because of the, the example that they showed us, you know, her and her siblings, none of them are married. None of them want to do that. It's, 
it has to be hard. I know when I was growing up, my mama would cook these because she did, she worked in the home and she would cook these fantastic dinners. I knew that they would fight. My parents never fought in front of me, but when my mama would not cook dinner, I was like, what are we having for dinner? And she would say, go in there and get you a bowl of cereal. I immediately turned to my dad and said, what did you do? Like, what have you done to her? Fix it. Fix whatever's going on between y'all. I, you know, and he would say, it's not me, it's her. And I'd say, listen, I, I don't want Fruity Pebbles for dinner. Fix it. <laughs> so he would fix it, and the next night we would have these great dinners again. That taught me, you hurt her, right. you have to fix it, right. and then things get better. There's, there's a way to fix things. So yeah. to te- it's not just about me and you. It's about the people that look into it. We live in a fishbowl, kind of, oh, and right. people are looking at us. If, the, if we're mad all the time and nothing ever gets better, what are we teaching people about oh, us, too? You know? Well, so that rolls right into the next one. And the next one is, so the third of how to tear down the walls. Number one, humble myself. Number two, forgive my spouse. Number three is choose to talk about the issues. Choose to talk about the issues. I love this verse in Proverbs 16, 13. It says, righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. You say, how in the world does that have anything to do with marriage? Well, think about a king. A king is surrounded by lots of people who, who want to take advantage of his influence. And the people that are around a king will often say whatever they think the king wants to hear. A bunch of yes men. And so, so if a king has someone around him who maybe knew him when he was younger, who maybe has a relationship, if a king has someone around him that will speak truth to him, now he can get somewhere. But so many times, everybody just tells him what he wants to hear. In marriage, so many times, you know when your spouse is mad at you and you know what she's mad about. Uh, but, but why do we not engage the conversation? Because we don't want the fight. We don't want the conflict. And so, so many times we just, we just smooth it over and we don't say the thing. But the Word says that, that, that righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he who loves him uh, who speaks what is right. you got to say the things. And so one of the things, we're not perfect at this, but a couple years ago, somebody challenged us to start going on date nights. Now, sometimes we get on date nights, and because we work together, we'll end up talking about work the whole time. But other times, we get on date night, and if we're doing well with it, we'll sit across the table. Y'all, I ain't going to tell you no lie. There have been times at Outback where we got in a hot mess of a fight. I mean, I'm sitting there eating supper by myself at Outback because we started addressing issues in the Outback, and she's sitting on the bench out front because she's so mad at me. But you know what happened? We addressed the issues. We, addre- we said the things that needed to be said. We got, we got upset. We did all the thing, whatever. And that continued on into finding resolution. And that's the thing. And you can't make it personal. It's just about the issue. That's good. It's just about the issue. It's not about everything that makes that person that what person. What your daddy it's, did, what yes, your mama did. it's about did. the issue. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Last one, and we'll start wrapping up here. Here's the last one. Trust God. Trust God. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, such a powerful verse. You've heard this lots of times. It says, trust in the Lord. Who are you putting your trust in? Are you trusting that your spouse is going to complete you? Are you trusting that your spouse is going to fix everything? Are you trusting even in yourself that you can fix your marriage? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. What is, what, what's he telling us right there? If I could just look right into your eyes right now, there's some of you sitting here who are in relationships. You're sharing the spatula, sharing the TV, even sharing a mattress, but you're not sharing hearts. And the truth may be known this morning that in your relationship, you don't know how it's ever going to be fixed. You might think things like there's too much water under the bridge. He'll never change. She's always going to be this way. Well, what I've found in life has been anytime I try to fix things on my own, there's, God, God does expect us to do what we can, but my power, my ability is so limited, but God can change things. God can break chains. God can change hearts. God can change future. I could bring a dozen people on this stage right now who could tell you that I once was that, and God changed me, and I'm now this. And so I want you to hear this morning that whatever the state of your relationship is, it's not over. Could I ask you to stand to your feet right now? We're going to do something just a little bit different this morning. Um, 
I believe that God wants to, I believe that God wants to respond to what he's saying to you. He is saying to you that I want to step in and I want to help you. But faith is more about what happens with your feet than it is with what happens between your ears. And God meets us in our faith when we step out and we take a stand. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Our, our band's going to begin to play behind me in just a moment. But in this room, um, I'm going to give you some instructions. If you're watching online, I want you to do the same thing. Any of you who are, are couples right now, if you're a couple and your, your, your spouse, your significant other, whatever the case may be, is in this room with you, I want you to get together and I'm going to ask every couple in this room, all of the married folks, and maybe if you're in a committed relationship, I want you to come down to this front, front row right here. Come down to this altar. And I want you to take some time. Come on, start coming now. Couple, start coming. I need some folks to be the first ones to come. Come on, come on. I want you to come down here. And we're going to pray this morning. See this, you're not on your own. We're going to pray this morning. And I believe God wants to heal some families today. I believe God wants to to tear down some walls. You guys, if you want to find a seat on this front row, Sadiq, if you, you, mind, you mind sliding back one row so some folks can sit down there. Some of y'all want to kneel right down here. Plenty of room on this front row, second row. Just find a place. Just find a place. And I want you to, I want you to just make your way up here. Get with your significant other there. And, and, and I want you just to, just to get together. I'm going to pray over you in a minute. Guys, if you want to pray over your wives, I think that is a beautiful thing. If you don't feel comfortable in doing that, I'm going to pray for you. But we're going to ask God to do some amazing things right now. So as, as our worship team begins to play behind us, why don't you just close your, close your eyes. If you're not holding on to your, your spouse right now, your significant other, grab their hand, put your arm around them. This is a moment of intimacy. Father, you see your children right now. You hear their hearts, God. You see their feet moving, Lord. They have moved here and come forward today because they're saying, God, we need you. God, help us. God, that picture of closeness and intimacy and two wrapped up, tangled up together, both physically and in our hearts. God, we crave that so much. But Lord, the devil is alive and he's active and he's come to steal and kill and destroy. And we have been way too willing to allow him into our homes and into our marriages. God, we have way too often forsaken the practices of praying together and reading the Bible and coming to church and growing in you. But God, today, we declare that everything changes. And Lord, we're just praying together as a church family that we're going to take a stand. And we're going to love our spouses and we're going to create families, God, that will, be, that will be a witness to our kids, to our families, to our communities. God, make us different. Make us the way you would have us to be. Lord, right now, everyone that's here is a couple. God, you know the walls that have gone up. You know the heartbreak that has taken place, Lord. Lord, right now needs to be a moment where forgiveness takes place. Right now needs to be a moment where the past is put in the past. Pray for that, God. Lord, you know the situation and the condition of every family, of every heart. Lord, in some cases, terrible things have been done, but if they're willing and you're willing, there's nothing that can't be over, overcome. God, there's some maybe here today who've been married for a number of years, and they've never had one hard conversation, never looked in each other's eyes and said, we need to talk about this. There's some things we need to change. I pray that you will give them courage today. Give them grace with each other, God, when they have these conversations to put love on the table. Lord, let us have these conversations in love and let us work through things. God, that last point, trust God, we need you. That's where we land today, God. I don't know how to pray to break every chain. I don't know how to pray to fix every marriage, but you do. And your people have stepped out and they've said, God, we're here. Help us. I pray that you'll meet us all right here in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.